Friends, welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge and Morgan Snyder here in the studio in the week after Easter, wanting to grab hold of that, wanting to stay with Easter and stay with what it means and promises to us and kind of carry on a conversation that we actually began in the week before Easter, talking about this life that is available to us now. What does it mean to participate in that now? And as I was sitting at the breakfast table this morning, Morgs, and kind of getting my thoughts together for being in the studio with you today, Jesus brought me back to this crazy story in the book of Acts, chapter 5, that I want to read and get your reaction to this. Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and Pentecost has come, and you know Christ ascends to the throne, Pentecost comes, and now the church is exploding. Mm-hmm. Like, the battle of the kingdoms has shifted from Jesus invading to his people invading, right? Mm-hmm. They're kind of carrying, carrying on the mission here, empowered by him. So Acts chapter 5, verse 12 begins, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Okay, so that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Wow, like this thing is beginning to explode. And the main point is that as a result of what they're experiencing, more and more people are converting, more and more people are becoming followers of Christ. Then this. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Mm. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, the angel says to them. Stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. You go, wait, wait, that's the gospel? Like the angel's telling them, you got to carry on, right? Carry on. Like go right back out there. Go right back out there. And here's what I want you to tell them. And what he tells them is, make sure you keep telling them the full message of heaven when you die. No. He says, tell them the full message of this new life. John, it's very disruptive because in that story, as you read, it says they believed and many were added to their number. So clearly belief has a huge piece of this equation. And yet, as you said, the mandate is to share the way of this life. The implications are it's full. It's a comprehensive way of life. And what's amazing of that worldview is you cannot separate the idea of being saved from being a disciple, that the worldview of Scripture was that was a complete reality, that you are saved and being saved, as Paul says, right? Yes. That you are an apprentice yes. of the way. Yes, because they saw discipleship as embracing a life, mm. right? That's why it wasn't incongruous. Yes. It wasn't, oh, well, salvation means Heaven when you die. Yes. It does mean that, by the way, folks. It's just that it means a ton more than that. Yes. Right. And then there's kind of this moral life you need to live now, sort of a life of character. Yes. What they connected was, no, the angel said that the gospel can be described as the message of this new life available to us. Mm. Okay. And therefore, discipleship was, for them, a way of living that allowed them to tap into that. Yes. So, gang, here we are right after Easter. We want to not just turn our gaze to what needs to get done this week. We want to stay with Easter, stay with the power of the resurrection, stay with there is an indestructible life that has broken into this world. 
And it is a life that is shared with you when you give your life to God, when you give your heart and soul over to the keeping of Jesus Christ. And one of the big shifts that takes place in any Christian's experience is when they come to realize that Christianity is not primarily a set of beliefs or morals or social actions. The, the Christianity is primarily a way of life that allows you to draw upon more and more the life of God. Tell them the message of this new life, like that what Christianity primarily is is not necessarily a comprehensive theology or philosophy in its actual living out, in its participation. It is the things you do in order to more fully draw upon the life of God in you now, like being filled and transformed by the life of God. So here's what we thought would be helpful, Gay. We thought that in the podcast after Easter to ask, so what do you do to draw upon the life of God? What do you do? Yeah, John, it's so good because we're not saying something new. We are simply recovering the truth that's been the reality of the church since the earliest days. Exactly. So what are the things that you that I, or that those we love, are currently doing Mm -hmm. to tap into the message of this new life, to tap into the vine, to tap into Easter, to tap into the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Like, what are you currently doing? What does that look like? Get really practical. Yeah, that's good, John. I think the first thing that comes to mind that I would offer, you know, we have this category in the mission of Ransom Heart and centered in all of our retreats, if you've ever experienced one live, is sending people out to be with God and ask God what he thinks of us. Mm. And many people we interact with have these supernatural stories of God speaking to them, their name, right? The scripture says, Ephesians 2.10, that we're all a worksmanship, a masterpiece, a poema. Mm -hmm. But we have to know who that is. And I confess, like most of our friends and allies, I ask God that question once in a while, like once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. And somewhere tucked away in some journal or Mm -hmm. a few things he might have said years ago, Mm -hmm. it's not something I practice. Mm -hmm. But the scriptures make clear this conversational intimacy where the Father is constantly wanting to communicate who we are to him. Mm -hmm. And so recently I was challenged by a sage in my life to ask God what he thinks of me, not just once. But again and again and again, all throughout the day. And John, it was, I will say, revolutionary. And let me give you an example. So I'm teaching my kids how to ski. Abigail's eight, Joshua's 11. We live in Colorado, but skiing's fairly expensive and there's all sorts of winter activities to do. And so I grew up skiing out east, but we just haven't dove into that world. But the kids get a free pass for the year because of a school thing. And so we bit the bullet and outfitted them with skis and I'm teaching my kids how to ski, and Abigail's in front of me after I teach her her kind of snowplow pizza wedge. She's doing these beautiful turns, her second time up the magic carpet and down. And where I go habitually when I'm behind her, this beautiful moment, I go to, man, I should have got her a new jacket. Like, that thing is old and ratty, or how are we going to afford to keep doing this, or what do I do next? Do you just hear the reaction of the false in me arranging for life, maximizing, Mm. and I'm simply not present? Mm. And right in that moment, oh, okay, here's the practicing. Because I'm skiing. You know, this isn't a contemplative moment. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, what do you think of me? Mm -hmm. And he just said, son, you're a great dad. Mm. Look at your little princess. Mm. She's beaming. Mm. We're on the chairlift later on. I'm with Joshua. And we're just chatting, and I'm realizing I'm a little uncomfortable because my memories of learning how to ski were mostly fear, shame. I'm not doing it well enough. Yeah. So I'm projecting that on him. Yeah. He's great. You know, he's yeah. chewing on a honey stick, and he's happy as can be. And Joshua makes the comment, 
You know, Dad, maybe when I'm in high school, I'll become a ski instructor on weekends. And just the, the happiness. The boy's happy. He's never skied in his life. And here he is yeah. planning on being a ski instructor. And I'm going to arranging for the future or where I'm failing. And I said, God, what do you think of me? And he said, mm. look at your fathering. Look what he's become mm. when you were in that same place with fear and shame. Mm. And so, John, even an example of I am now finding myself a dozen times during the day in a meeting, in an activity, in a conversation with my wife, in a juncture of choice where the mm. unseen moments where you know in your true heart you're choosing heroically, but the false self is just screaming for a different interpretation mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. arranging – just asking God casually in that moment, Father, yeah. what do you see? Yeah. What do you want to say? What's your interpretation of this moment right yeah. here, right now? Yeah. And I just want to point out, friends, as you're hearing that, because that does at least two things. One, as you do hear from God, it reorients your entire perspective. Absolutely. It settles you back into God. But here's the other thing. Simply the act of asking is reorienting your spirit's attention to God. Mm. And that's huge. Yes. Like whatever you can do during the day that reorients your spirit's attention to God, like a question, yes. right? Or worship, yeah. you know, or looking out the window, you know, to the bird that's sitting on the branch and yes. how much joy it brings you. Like that choice to ask now yes. several times a day is both bringing you the fruit of what he has to say, yes. right? bringing you the fruit of the interpretation, but it's also bringing you the fruit of choosing yes. to turn your attention back to God. Yes. And the more that you can do that, I mean, that's Brother Lawrence, right? That's practicing the presence of God. Right, and the brilliance of that, John, is that mm -hmm. the disciplines allow us to structure our life based on activities that are in our control. We can choose yeah, totally. things that are in our control to totally. make us more accessible totally. to things that are not in our control, right? Because totally. grace is God acting in a way we can't control or arrange mm -hmm. for, but we can actually arrange our days to mm -hmm. make us more and more accessible and aligned with the reality yeah. of his kingdom coming. Yeah. So, for example, I wrote a recent Ann Sons magazine article on this in the March issue, but what I am doing is... I am turning my phone off at 8 p.m. And just like, I don't care who it is. Yes. Like, you cannot invade my world after 8 p.m. It's my way of detaching from the chaos of the world and just having some space. And when I get up in the morning, what I used to do, the very first thing I'd do is go out and I would check my text, mm -hmm. primarily for my children, mm -hmm. you know, my adult children. Are they in need? Do they have a question that, you know, but you make yourself available first thing in the morning to the world, you're going to get all kinds of stuff coming at you mm. that'll knock you sideways, you know. And so I don't turn it back on until I have prayed. Yes. And found God. Mm -hmm. And even then, gone and had breakfast. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm disciplining my phone and just saying, you cannot have my soul. You yes. cannot have my world. I will not let you, you know, allow the entire influx of the chaos of the world into my life. There's got to be some place where you unplug. Mm. Where and when do you unplug every day, mm. gang? Like, that's the idea. Everybody, where do you, yes. <laughs> yep. where do you unplug every day? Okay, can I add personal worship? Mm. And you can get it in so many ways. Your car. Mm -hmm. Like you should always have a worship CD or have your iPod plugged into your car available. So, you know, I got to run to the hardware store. I got to fix something at home. I'm like, hey, I got 17 minutes here. Yep. Yep. I'm grabbing it. And rather than listening to the news, right, or March Madness, you know, the basketball game I'm interested in, Turn the worship on. Yes. If you exercise, if you go for a walk, if you take your dogs for a walk, like put on the iPod, turn on some worship. You know, is it evening? Is it right before bed? Is that when you've got five minutes? Yes. Five minutes is great, gang. We're not talking about you now need a life of worship. Yes. Don't set these high, 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 high standards. I'm talking about do you have five minutes in the morning? Do you have your drive time? Could you possibly grab your lunch? Like, where's a few moments to allow personal worship 
into your day. And I was just talking to one of my sons last night, catching up, and he had had a really hard week and some things had gone totally sideways in his world. And he was pretty fried and he actually went out and broke the fence in the yard, <laughs> which is just a very funny guy thing to do. You know, he popped, all right? He popped. He blew a gasket. But then he realized, that's not what I need. I need God. And so he came back in and, and he told the story of all I did was just lay down on my bed and I turned on worship. And he said, it was like before that, I was two hearted. And when I was done, I was one heart mm. again. Mm. I was not a divided self yeah. after that. So I would just add that yes. as, a, as a simple thing. What else, Morgs, do you do to draw upon the life of God? Yeah, John, it's so good. As you're sharing that story, what comes to my heart is that act of simply laying on the bed, it is heroic defiance of evil. It is lifestyle warfare. It is remarkably courageous because it's a turning of the soul. It's engaging of the will to say, no, no, I choose God in spite of my circumstances. I know for me, I'm an intense person. It's the image of God in me. And when that's in the service of the false self, which is often, I get exhausted, weary, overcommitted. So I was on mission overseas and it was beautiful. And I'm back and now I'm paying the price of coming back to another mission and still everything and everyone is screaming for some peace. So Sunday was the first Sabbath in our household where we were back in our kind of normal routine. Mm -hmm. And I could feel the temptation of all these very legitimate and sincere pressing needs to tend to. But deeper than that, out of practicing, I've learned that it must be all activity for me must begin with practicing the activity of stillness. Mm. I have to get still. Mm. So I took a long bike ride because I just needed to burn some energy. And then after that, instead of the old version of now race home and plug back to the family, Sherry knows, like, we both need some things for Sabbath rest. Mm -hmm. And so I took my truck. I have this little camp chair packs up in my backpack that I keep in my truck all the time. And I found this nondescript little kind of hideout I have In Colorado Springs, I've got a lot of them where it's just this little piece of wild. Mm -hmm. And I took a hundred yard walk from the truck and I sat, no Bible, no journal. I had a cup of coffee and a cigar and I sat for one hour in stillness. And it was amazing in that time, John, as you know, it's just the beginning of spring here. So everything is still in dormancy and it looks very dead. Mm -hmm. And I love wilderness and I love green and life. And so it was actually hard to sit there at first. And then as I'm sitting in stillness, I'm sinking into the reality. I'm sensing the presence of God. And now I'm noticing little green shoots coming Mm -hmm. up everywhere. Mm -hmm. A blue jay come and and lights on this branch three feet away. Mm -hmm. And then a hawk is doing these circles. And Mm -hmm. I feel my soul being tended to. It's like that scene from after Jesus' great trial in the wilderness where it says the angels ministered to him. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what that means, but I find myself increasingly in situations where that scripture comes to mind and I feel like the Holy Spirit says, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm simply tending to your your battle-weary hands. And after one hour, there was a settledness, a centeredness, a strength. And Mm -hmm. I went back and we played cards with the Mm. kids and we tended to some net necessities, but it was out Mm -hmm. of this robust well-being that Isaiah 66 talks about rather than out of just this knee-jerk reaction to appease something and tend to pain. Right, right. And gang, don't get lost on the hour piece. He's been doing this for years and he can now do an hour. You could start with two minutes. Absolutely. Two minutes of stillness absolutely blow your mind. And it's usually and two minutes to five minutes, and right? And it's five. Yeah. And then you could go to 10, right? If you had 10 minutes of stillness in your life every day, gang, it will literally make you a different being. Mm-hmm. I want to add another one that's become utterly beautiful and crucial for me. I realized I didn't understand it till it started happening, but the need drove me. And what drove me to, I need to go 
and experience nature. And I'm talking about like in the yard or in the neighborhood. I'm not Mm -hmm. talking about, you know, oh, getting away to the beach or, you know. No, no, no. I'm talking about 15 minutes. I'll take the dogs for a walk or I'll just go and I'll be in the yard. And what I needed to do was I needed to touch and hear and smell real things. Mm. And I began to realize this. My entire day is spent with the artificial. Mm. So as a writer, primarily, I spend a lot of time in front of a computer screen. And that's actually not good for the soul. And then I spend a lot of time on the phone, right? And that's artificial as well. The technology of it is artificial. I found that for relief in the evenings, I would often watch something on the History mm-hmm. Channel or, you know, a nature show that I liked or whatever. You know, but that's also a screen. Mm. And I just realized, my gosh, I am spending, you know, I like my truck, but my truck is an artificial thing. Mm-hmm. It makes artificial noises, right? Mm. You know, it's the creation of man. It's very helpful. And I started going, wait a second, like my chair at work is plastic. All mm. the things in my world are not real things. Your soul needs the real. I just don't know how to say this with enough passion or clarity, but your soul was designed to live in a certain environment. And most of us don't anymore. And it's not nourishing. It's Mm -hmm. very, very depleting to the soul. And so it was crazy. Here was my first experience of this. I would spend a couple hours in front of the screen writing or editing something or answering email or just all that stuff, you know. And I would need to go outside, literally take two steps outside the front door and touch something real. Mm. I would need to touch a rock. I would need to touch soil. I would need to touch the bark of a tree. And I began to notice this going, whoa, John, like kind of weird, dude. Like what's, <laughs> what's going on? Like what is this? And then it just – it grew and it grew. Mm. And I found myself on my walks with the dogs recently. Like I will kneel down and touch the earth. Mm. I will feel plants. And it's like, John, are you like, are you okay? (laughs) Like, is this some sort of sign of deep soul unwellness? And I finally realized, no, no, no. I am absolutely depleted on reality, Mm. the world as God created it. And your entire being, like literally your eyes, your ears, your fingertips, your nose, you are created to draw life from God's world, not the artificial world, not screens, technology, you know, artificial things from the real world. And so a new micro discipline for me is every day I have to have the real. I have to have the real. Mm. It's going to seem like so simple. It's like, you're kidding me. Try it. Like, it's going to blow you away how important it is to hear the actual sound of water, Mm. to pause before you get in your car and to hear the sound of wind Mm. in the trees, to watch sunlight in the grass. Like it actually restores your soul. It heals your soul from the assault of the world. Mm. We were meant to live in a God-bathed, God-breathed, God-reality. Again, these were just meant to be examples of a hundred different choices you can make out of Easter to say, I want the life of God. Mm -hmm. I need more of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ flowing into my life. How do I tap into that? Yes, John, you know, in and of themselves, they're merely activities. But the point of practicing these activities, experimenting, trying them on, see what works, is to have an increasing access to what we started this podcast with, a way of life that Jesus says, to go out and train everyone you meet near and far in this way of life. Yeah. So, Jesus, catch our hearts, catch our hearts right now, wherever it is we're going with this. No shame, no guilt, no pressure, no New Year's resolutions, being remade, Jesus, we just have one simple question. What do you want me to do? What can I begin to do this week to tap into you, to tap into your life? Mm. What little choices, what little adjustments to my day are you inviting me into to find you and to find your life? That's our prayer. 
Amen, friends. Amen. Hope you've enjoyed the Easter week and the post-Easter week podcast that Morgan and I have been doing. And invite you always for more. If you haven't tapped into the Ransomed Heart app, oh my goodness, it's so helpful. It's all free. Or come to our website at ransomedheart.com. Lots more good things there for your life in God.